Well, good morning and uh, uh, welcome to the second day of this school. Uh, as uh, I did yesterday, today also I will continue with this uh, preparatory lecture on uh, certain basic things about the statistical mechanics of interacting system of particles. Uh, yesterday I was talking about uh, basically the gas, uh, non-ideal gas, effects of interactions on the equation of state and other properties of uh, gases at high temperatures, low densities. Of course, I mean, uh, as I was indicating uh, uh, yesterday, as one goes to low temperatures, for example, then effects of interactions become more pronounced, and one cannot just use uh, simple perturbation theory to understand what is going on. Uh, and uh, physically what happens is that if you have an um, attractive part of the interaction between two particles uh, in the system, then at uh, low enough temperatures, there is a liquid phase. Uh, and then, of course, still what temperatures, the liquid typically goes into some kind of a crystalline solid state. Uh, so today, I'll talk about some properties of this liquid state. And uh, in particular, I mean, uh, yesterday I told you how to, how, to, how to sort of derive the Van der Waals equation. And uh, if you analyze the Van der Waals equation that you have probably done in some uh, course earlier, uh, it shows that uh, there is an instability and uh, there is a gas to liquid uh, phase transition even within that framework of the Van der Waals equation. It doesn't give you a very good uh, description of the transition, but at least shows that at uh, low enough temperatures, something else is going to happen. Uh, and then the question is uh, uh, how one uh, then describes the liquid that uh, one has at uh, low enough temperatures and uh, uh, high enough densities. <clears throat> now, uh, this is actually an area which is, uh, in some sense, uh, not very satisfactory in the sense that uh, in the liquid, the effects of interactions play a very important role, but there is no sort of a very uh, accurate method, theoretical method, to actually uh, calculate uh, various properties of liquids uh, because of the fact that, again, you have to take into account the effects of interactions in a more rigorous uh, way as compared to what you do in the uh, gaseous phase. <laughs> so, uh, I'll, of course, uh, one lecture will not have a lot of time to talk about all the theoretical methods that people use to describe the properties of liquids. Uh, what I'm going to do, and this is again sort of dictated by uh, requests from uh, people who are uh, who will be giving lectures next week on uh, basically uh, glass forming liquids and uh, glasses and uh, things like that, uh, to sort of uh, introduce to you uh, uh, set of correlation functions that uh, often people use to describe the equilibrium properties of liquids, define those things and uh, sort of uh, uh, work out how they are related to one another and what is the importance of these correlation functions. And then uh, depending on how much time is left, I will also give you some idea about theoretically how one can calculate these correlation functions. <clears throat> So, I mean, again, you know, just uh, like yesterday, I would like to know, I mean, to what extent the people here are familiar with this. I mean, uh, uh, these correlation functions have very specific names. Uh, paired distribution function, for example, for a liquid. I mean, it can also define for a gas, but I mean, typically uh, it's used to describe the properties of a liquid. How many people have seen this? Or static structure factor? Okay, roughly about half. Uh, so yeah, that uh, tells me that you know, there are uh, people who are not familiar with it, uh, but there are also people who uh, will be bored if I sort of spend a whole lot of time on, on these things. So I'll try to sort of uh, go through it, uh, go through these things quickly, uh, and we'll see that you know maybe uh, there are some things that will be useful to people who have seen this thing uh, earlier also. <clears throat> so the uh, plan of the talk today is basically to introduce these functions, uh, tell you a little bit about how one can. Uh, uh, determine the properties, certain properties of the equilibrium liquid state from these functions. And then uh, towards the end, I'll tell you a little bit about how one actually can <coughs> correlate, uh, how one uh, can, can actually calculate uh, these functions uh, given a particular model. Model basically, uh, the interaction potential between pairs of particles, that is basically what defines your model. <coughs> so, <coughs> I'll start with, in some sense, a general discussion, uh, which is in terms of what is known as n particle distribution function. <clears throat> 
Again, I'm dealing with a classical system of particles. Uh, let's say we'll start canonical ensembles. Number of particles is fixed. Volume is given to you, uh, and uh, a temperature. And uh, the other thing that you need to know to be able to sort of do theoretical calculation is the interaction. And the interactions I had discussed in the last uh, lecture, similar kind of interactions will be considered here also. Let's say a pairwise interaction between particles. Uh, and these interactions have uh, basically a hard core uh, and uh, short distances and uh, longer distances. It has a weak attractive part. That's, that's the model. And in particular, I'll define this function uh, <coughs> u, which is a function of R1 or n. And uh, I'll not worry at all about the kinetic energy. I mean, that part in a classical system can be taken into account very easily. So basically, uh, probabilities and things like that of finding a particle here, a particle there, etc., are all determined by this potential energy function. <clears throat> and in particular, uh, I'll define some uh, uh, partition function which is associated with this potential energy definition, product over i, positions of all the particles, e to the minus beta times this u function, r1. This is, in some sense, this is a definition, basically a partition function associated with the kinetic energy. Not kinetic energy, the potential energy of all these particles when they're located at points R1 up to Rn. <clears throat> now, what is this function? Now, this, uh, given this, let's say, this defines my problem, and number of particles and volume are also given to you, temperature is given to you, beta is 1 over kBT. So then the question is, uh, if I want to ask this question, that if I find a particular here, let's say at the origin, then what is the probability of finding another particle at some distance r from this origin? <clears throat> Similarly, you know, one can generalize this instead of looking at two-point correlation functions, one can look at n-point correlation functions or n-point distribution functions, where uh, what you do is we basically specify uh, some points in your, in your box and draw a little volumes here. This is, let's say, uh, some point r1, and this volume is some delta r1. And similarly, you do another point here, which is uh, <coughs> R2 and delta R2, et cetera, et cetera. And do this uh, when I'm talking about little n uh, distribution function. So there will be another, eventually, a point which is R sub n. And there will be a little volume, delta Rn. And this whole thing is in your, in your box, in which you have put these n particles. And then one can ask this following question, that uh, what is the probability that there will be one particle in this little volume, one particle in this little volume, another particle in this little volume like that. So given this n such little boxes, one can ask the question of what is the probability that there will be n particles in these boxes. And uh, <clears throat> this probability is going to be related to this distribution function. And of course, I mean, you know, it's, it's a fairly simple thing to actually conceptualize. What you're doing is that you are looking at a situation, there is one particle here, one particle here, one particle there. Uh, let's say for n equals 3, where uh, you have these three little boxes. But all the other particles can be anywhere in the box. So basically what you have to look at is the, kind of, is the potential energy of the system where you have fixed these particles uh, in these little volumes and uh, where all the other particles can be anywhere and uh, look at the corresponding potential energy and uh, use that to define the probability, Boltzmann probability, associated with finding n particles in these n little boxes. So <clears throat> this distribution function is going to be defined in the following way, that uh, I'll call this P, and there's an n superscript, function of R1, R2, up to Rn, n coordinates, and then you multiply it by these volume elements, delta R1, delta R2, up to delta Rn. This quantity has to be, this is the definition of this, of this function, function of uh, n arguments, is the probability of finding n particles one at a time, one particle here, one particle here, one particle there, in the volumes, little volumes, delta Ri. I goes from 1 to n. So this is basically the general definition of a distribution function. What we are looking at is the simultaneous probability, joint probability, of finding a certain number of particles, n number of particles, at uh, these little boxes, which are centered at 
some uh, specific points, R1, F2, Rn, uh, in the box, and all the other particles can be anywhere else. <coughs> so given this potential energy function, then how does one define this probability? This probability will be then, basically, what you have to do is you have to look at the potential energy when uh, you have one particle here, one particle here, one particle there. Everything can be, other particles can be anywhere else. So basically, what you have to do is you have to look at this kind of an integral. Product over i. <coughs> here, the product over i goes from 1 to capital N, all the particles. But here, I am fixing little n particles and allowing all the other particles to uh, take arbitrary positions. So the integrals will be n plus 1 to capital N, e to the minus beta, and then u function. But then you have r1, r2. These positions are fixed. And then you have r n plus 1, or capital S. <coughs> n particles I have kept fixed in these little volumes. All the other particles uh, are allowed to vary, and these integrals over dri. And then uh, normalization is that you have to <coughs> normalize by zu, which I have defined here. And there is one more thing. Uh, can you guess what the other thing will be? So this is the probability that uh, there could be any particle here, any particle there, any particle there. I'm not giving, saying that particle uh, number one is here, particle number two is there, particle number three is there. So there will be a counting factor. There are uh, uh, how many ways you can choose these n particles from the capital N particles that you have in your system. So that will be this quantity. N factorial, and this is my this p function. So again, uh, the prescription is quite simple. Uh, here I am specifying the positions of some of the particles, saying that uh, there has to be one particle close to R1, similarly one particle close to R2, and one particle close to R Rn, and, and so on. But I'm not saying which particle has to be where. So that gives me this combinatorial factor. And then the statistical weight associated with that is related to the potential energy, where I have keep one particle fixed R2. So these are not being integrated out. These R1, R2, Rn, the same as the arguments that you have here. But all the other particles are from n plus 1 to capital N, they can be anywhere. So you are integrating over the positions of all the other particles, and uh, then you normalize by the partition function associated with the potential energy function. OK, everybody with me? Doesn't matter. Hmm? No, 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 I mean, what, uh, see, that's, it just basically comes from the fact that if I look at this volume, how many ways you can choose the particle to be put there? That's capital N. Once you have put there, how many ways you can do it there? That's capital N minus 1. So whatever you have here is basically N times N minus 1 all the way up to N minus little n plus 1. Huh? Which, which other particles? Huh. Yes. Huh. That's what this... That's right. That is there. So how many different ways? I mean, you know, if I look at... Uh, Two points. I mean, this is just look at particle one and particle two. Hmm? There it is a configuration where uh, any one of the particles you can choose to be in this particular point. Right? So uh, this I can choose in n different ways. Once I have put one particle here, let's say particle number five I have put there. Then how many choices I have there? there? Right? n minus one. So how many different distinct configurations are there where I have one particle here and one particle there? Yeah, but that will not be there. That's what I'm saying. Because here, when you are integrating out this R1 up to Rn, you are saying that you are associating labels with the particles. 
That is classical statistical mechanics, right? So you have to basically count after you have done that, how many configurations are there in which one particle is here, one particle is there. Uh, but you know, here, uh, yeah. So I mean, you, know, you often have this uh, thing which is n, little n, but it is not that. That's what we have to understand. Yeah. That's a classical way of dealing with uh, identical particles. That's why eventually you have to put in this one over n factorial, but this uh, cancels out between here and there, so I don't put that. Yeah. And we'll see that uh, this sort of makes sense. I mean, at this point, it is generally the sense that this n can be anything. n can be anything which is, uh, goes from 1 to capital N. So let's see. Uh, now, the special cases, small values of little n, what uh, sort of information these uh, uh, distribution functions contain. So uh, first thing, of course, I mean, you know, we can look at this P1 of R. Uh, what does it do? So here, if I, let's call it R1. Here, I'm going to integrate out over all of these R's except this R1. I'm going to integrate out from R2 up to Rn. Downstairs, I'm going to integrate out over all the R's. But the integral that you get upstairs and downstairs are very closely, uh, essentially related to each other, simply by a factor of volume. Because I could choose always, I mean, you know, this, this potentials, uh, the models that we are looking at are functions of the difference between the two coordinates, R1 minus R2, R1 minus R3, etc. So I can always put uh, the first uh, R1, choose R, R1 to be, to be my origin, and then integrate over all the other distances. That you will get the same integral upstairs and downstairs, but downstairs there is one extra integral because it is uh, integral over all the RIs. So this is going to be if I look at the ratio, <coughs> 1 over volume, and then here, little n equal to 1 will give me n. So the one-point function is just the just average density. That is uh, simple, that, you know, just the probability that if I draw a little box here, I look at uh, the probability of finding a particle in this little box, uh, which is volume uh, delta R1, and uh, <coughs> that is basically finding, let's say, particle 1 in that volume is proportional to delta R1 divided by volume. And there are n particles, so you have to add up the probabilities, the probability of finding 2, 3, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then there will be a factor of capital N. So this N by V is then P1. It's a simple thing. And of course, I mean, we're assuming the system is uh, transitionally invariant. We're assuming that the potential is just a function of the difference between the two coordinates. So a simple translation doesn't change anything. So every point in the liquid is equivalent to every other point. So the local density, local number density. So this is basically the local number density, which is the same. It doesn't depend on which point in the liquid you are looking at. That's simple. The most important uh, such function that one deals with in the theory of liquids is the n equals 2, the pair function. And the pair function is P2. I goes from 3 to n. You are 1, are 2. Same arguments as what you have arguments there. These are in two particles, one at R1, or a small volume near R1, and another particle, small volume near R2. Uh, and then, of course, you have R3 all the way up to Rn. <clears throat> so this is the two-point function. Now, uh, uh, just by looking at its uh, uh, definition, uh, 
one can uh, sort of uh, say that uh, these functions will have certain properties without actually going into details of any such calculation of, uh, uh, for a specific potential. The potential that we assume uh, becomes very large when the uh, two particles that we're looking at come very close to each other. So when R1 and R2 are very close to each other, then the potential diverges. So there is a probability associated with that, which is zero. So this quantity will have to go to zero when this R1 and R2 are very close to each other. Well, even before that, one thing that I should have mentioned is that if you have a translational invariant and isotropic system, the potential is such that uh, it depends only on the distance between particles, then this quantity also uh, will satisfy that property. That this quantity, P2, will not depend on exactly where R1 and R2 are specifically, but it depends only on the difference between these two coordinates. This will be a function of R1 mod. And I'll be looking at simple liquids which have this property, that uh, translationally invariant, isotropic, and so the correlations in the liquid will depend only, uh, two-point correlations will depend on the distance between the two points that we're looking at. So this uh, will go to zero as R1 minus R2 goes to zero. We'll start from zero. Now, if I make these two points very far away from each other, then what do you expect? So, I mean, again, just uh, going back to that picture. We don't have any R3 here. We have points R1 and R2 here, and then little circles, uh, volume delta R1 and delta R2 there. Uh, what is the probability of having a particle here, uh, another particle there, when these two things are very far apart? And uh, here you have to use the fact that the liquid, by definition, is a system where you have only short range, local order. That uh, unlike a crystal, in a crystal you know that if I put a particle in one crystal site, if I go very far away, then I'll again find another particle in a uh, crystalline site. But liquid doesn't have that kind of transitional order. So it is basically a disordered uh, phase of the system where you have only short range order. So if I make this R1 and R2 very far away from each other, then Yes, the joint probability will be simply the product, the probability of finding one particle in this little volume near R1, another particle in this little volume near R2, right? So what is the probability of finding one particle in this delta R1, which is something that I have already calculated here. If I don't worry about uh, this R2, just try to find out uh, what is the probability of find, finding one particle there, this delta R1 divided by volume, multiplied by N. So I put one particle there. What is the probability of finding another particle there? It's just, uh, you have to replace this n by n minus 1. Because one particle has been already put in the little volume, which is centered around R1. So when this R1 and R2 become very far each other, from each other, let's say, uh, notation goes to infinity. In practice, it is just bigger than, let's say, uh, five or six interparticle spacing. Uh, that's the short range order that you have in the liquid, but uh, uh, <coughs> we just look at that. So then it's just a product of the two probabilities. So one is n, then <coughs> delta r1, This is the probability of finding one particle in delta V1, uh, delta R1, one particle in delta R2, when the, uh, these two are very far apart from each other. So then this P2 will have this, these two factors will go away. So it's basically n times n minus 1 divided by n squared. And we'll be looking at a situation where this capital N is very large. So n minus 1 will approximate by n. And so this is basically uh, what we had earlier, p1. So actually call it rho as the <coughs> number density. So this goes as rho squared. So this is what uh, one would expect, that uh, the probability of finding two particles, one in a little volume here, one in a little uh, volume there, will be proportional to 
basically the uh, when the distance is very large, be proportional to the square of the number density, and that's uh, <coughs> illustration that you don't have this one of a little n factorial there. If you had there, then there would be a factor of two uh, in the in the denominator. If I wanted to calculate that, <coughs> so basically, uh, similarly, you know, one can one can look at uh, three point functions and, and so on and so forth. One can look at their asymptotic behavior as the distance between the points become very very large and so on and so forth. But uh, <coughs> we'll be dealing mostly with this two point function. And as you can see here, this two point function. Then, uh, if I want to look at this quantity p two of as a function of r. R is just a separation between the two points, and you will have, uh, let's say, R divided by some characteristic length scale sigma. Sigma, I mean, if you if you look at the kind of potentials that we are discussing earlier, uh, that will be the uh, this Leonard Jones parameter. Uh, or <coughs> actually, it's not quite that. I mean, the liquid, this Leonard Jones interparticle spacing is pretty much very similar to. So, if you have a potential that looks like this in a liquid. The typical interparticle spacings will be the same or close to this distance, where the minimum occurs, uh, where the potential becomes negative, and where the potential well, the bottom of that well, well occurs. But in general, I mean, what I'll do is I'll actually, to make it more general, I'll <coughs> say that it is uh, this A0 is the mean interparticle distance, determined by the density of the particles. So if number density I'm specifying here, which is basically the same thing as saying that so many particles are there and the volume is this much. So once you specify that, the mean inter interparticle distance is something that's easily calculated, and uh, <coughs> distance is measured as a function of that mean interparticle distance. And this is zero. We've already found out that because of this strong repulsion at short distances, this function will start from zero. And uh, at long distances, this function will go to rho squared. Uh, so it's useful to define a function which uh, this rho square is taken away. So this is I'll call it g of r. And this g of r, r function you'll see many times. I mean, when we're people talking about liquids and so on and so forth, this uh, g of r function comes up uh, in many different contexts, and it is called the pair distribution function. And uh, it starts from zero, goes to one at long distances. So, I mean, you know, one can uh, put the point here. This is my one. So it will be here at long distances. It will start from zero. Uh, <coughs> question is now, if I now look at, uh, uh, this is one, this is two, let's say this is three, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those who are familiar with this, uh, can you tell me what kind of uh, variation one expects in a liquid? So it will start from here, then uh, overshoot one, so I mean, just from, uh, instead of making a big deal out of it, it's very roughly, one has these oscillations, these oscillations tell you that uh, it's zero here, uh, and there are shells that uh, the, uh, typically at the nearest neighbor distance, uh, there will be a peak that if I fix a particle at the origin, and if I look at other particles surrounding it, if I go the nearest neighbor distance, then I'll see a peak, similarly, second neighbor, third neighbor, etc., etc. Eventually, because of the fact that the liquid doesn't have any long-range transitional order, these oscillations uh, cannot continue for a very large values of R. Eventually, it will go to 1. Uh, <coughs> if you had long-range order, if you had a crystal, for example, I mean, this G of R function can be defined uh, for any uh, any phase of the matter, it doesn't have to be liquid phase or gas phase or uh, crystal or any other solid. So, in a crystal, what do we expect for this uh, function to look like? So, these oscillations will continue to arbitrary long distances, and the distance up to which these oscillations continue is basically the extent of the short-range order that you have in the liquid. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, you know, uh, it's not, uh, this is one of the things, I mean, if you, for example, want to quantify 
the short range order that you have in a liquid. And what we said is exactly how you, you uh, what you do. You try to look at just the peaks of this. Uh, of course, I'm not very well drawn, but you just look at these points. And you try to, uh, so you look at a function which is again related to this function, which is again just a notation, you will call HR g of r minus 1, and this h of r is called a pair correlation function because it goes to 0 at long distances, so the correlations die off. So if you have h of r, then this is your 0. This line is 0. And you look at these points, these points will eventually go like that. You can try to fit some kind of an exponential function with it, and then that will give you a length parameter. And that length parameter one can use to quantify the degree of short range order that you have in your liquid. And typically, uh, even in dense liquids, it's like maybe three lattice spacings, so three or four maximum. Hmm? This A0 is the uh, inter average interparticle spacing. So when you have the number density, from that you can find out what the average interparticle spacing is. Okay, so this is uh, a very, very useful thing to, to yes. No. Okay, no, the, uh, one, you know, how, how, do, how does one determine this? One can do that in a numerical simulation. That's the most accurate way of doing that. There are some approximate theoretical ways of calculating that function, which I'll probably talk about a little later. Uh, none of them say that uh, these peaks have to uh, decay exponentially. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, let, me, let me just spend a little bit of time uh, uh, talking about a few things which are related to this geofar. I've done about half an hour, right? Okay. <clears throat> so the way that I have defined it, it's basically the joint probability of finding two particles one may be at the origin, the other is uh, at some point R. Uh, <clears throat> the second way of looking at it is basically this quantity to look at as a correlation function. And the correlation function is typically defined as the correlation between some quantity defined at two different points. So, I mean, the quantity that comes in here is the local density. So, this G of R can also be thought of as the correlation between the local density at the origin and the local density at some point R, which is separated from the origin. So how does that occur? So for, for that, we have to define some kind of a local density. Which I'll call n hat. Function of r at a particular point in space. r minus r sub i. Everybody is uh, happy with this? This is a delta, delta function, so one is basically looking at those particles uh, which are at this point R. Hmm? <laughs> delta is not there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, the definition of the local density. Now, uh, I want to look at then uh, the equal time correlation function of the local density. I want to look at, uh, when, again, you know, when you look at correlation functions, you can look at it as, I mean, the different kinds of correlation functions. You can look at uh, equal time correlation function or time displaced correlation functions and so on and so forth, depending on, you know, what you want to do. Uh, here we are doing equilibrium uh, properties, so we are looking at equal time correlation functions. And so I look at this, uh, <coughs> first of all, it is very easy to see that this, uh, in this, its average is basically P1. This basically is a delta function. If I put it uh, in such an expression, it will fix one of the coordinates to be at point R. And then there are n such uh, terms. So we'll get capital N. And then uh, <coughs> since there is one more integration downstairs, you have a factor of 1 over V. So in a, this is P1R, and that is equal to those in a translational invariant system which is what we are looking at. Now, what is this uh, two-point function of this local density? 
So two-point function uh, will turn out that it's very similar to this P2, but there is uh, this one term which one has to uh, take care of. So if I now look at this quantity, n of r, r, n hat of r primed, and I want to do this average, of course, means uh, with respect to, you see, to the minus beta u, that uh, measured. So this will have uh, sum over i, delta function r minus r sub i, and then second term is sum over j, delta function r primed minus r j. <clears throat> this kind of average. And uh, there, there is one term. See here, when we are doing this other thing, when you are doing P2, when I was saying that there is one particle which we have put in this delta R1, when we look at delta R2, we put a different particle. But here, that distinction is not there. Both the sums have uh, sums over all the particles. So there is a term which corresponds to I equals J. I equals J term is again easy to see. If I equals J, then this R prime has to be equal to R. <coughs> so this is basically a first term, delta R minus R prime, sum over I. And then when I is not equal to J, it's exactly the same thing that we have written down over there. That there is one particle near R, another particle near R prime. So when you put these two delta functions, that put two arguments of the Q equal to one equal to R and one equal to R prime, and then integrate out all the other ones. That's how uh, it's going to be defined. So, and this is equal to plus P2. And this average is nothing but the local density. This is the one point function. So it is delta R minus R primed multiplied by O and then plus rho squared G R R primed. So, I mean, this uh, two point density correlation function, this is a standard form of the uh, correlation function. You have a fluctuating quantity at one point in space, another fluctuating quantity somewhere else, and then you look at the correlation between them. So, you take the product of these two quantities and then calculate its thermodynamic average. So that is precisely what we are doing, looking at two-point density-density correlation function, equal time. And that quantity, apart from this uh, delta function that you have the origin, which basically comes from the I equals J term in this, in this double sum, uh, is basically uh, <coughs> same thing as what we had called P2 or G of R. So <coughs> similarly, I mean, in all the higher order uh, distribution functions, can be thought of as, uh, apart from this uh, few additional terms that you have when you are doing it uh, through the density, you will basically have a uh, three-point function, four-point function of the local density variable, equilibrium correlation function of density at two or three different points. <clears throat> so, uh, a few other things. I mean, why? Uh, well, just let me just also define uh, uh, some other thing which will be very useful as we go along, which is called the static structure factor, uh, which is basically the Fourier transform of the density density correlation function. So here we have uh, looked at this uh, uh, local density at point R, local density at point R primed, this kind of a correlation function. It will be, as I said, a function of R minus R primed uh, difference. I mean, if you have looked at a translational invariant system, it will be a function of the difference between these two coordinates. And uh, the translational invariant system, you can always define a uh, Fourier transform, k vector. So uh, we just uh, define uh, one more function, which will be useful. Standard Fourier transform that I am looking at this correlation function. Delta n is basically uh, the fluctuation of the density at point R is n hat 
<laughs> so one is just looking at the density deviation of the local density from its average value at point r and uh, similarly uh, density fluctuation at a different point r prime uh, this correlation function will depend only on r minus r prime if in a translational invariant system so one can define a Fourier transform with an appropriate phase factor. Uh, and then, uh, although there is a k vector here, here it depends only on little k, again, because of isotropy and, and, and so on. And so, forth. so uh, this is the function, which is, uh, again, just a Fourier transform, so to speak, of this g of r function, uh, because this uh, few things. What uh, this quantity is, of course, essentially related to what I have written down over there. And this correlation function is basically the P2, P2 itself is related to G of R. So this is basically the Fourier transform of this G of R two-point function. And uh, for a situation where the real space function looks like this, uh, the S of K, the static structure factor, so again, a name that one should be familiar with. And uh, this also has a uh, behavior, if I look at S of k versus now we have a times a zero. This is a dimensionless quantity. And uh, <coughs> behavior near the origin, there are many interesting things about it. Uh, you probably will uh, hear uh, people talking about this uh, hyper un uh, uniformity and how this S of k tail near k equals zero, that uh, how it goes to zero, or whether it goes to zero. Uh, <coughs> so that I will not uh, you know, spend a lot of time on at this point. Uh, in a standard liquid, it will be some, uh, start from some small value. It, it will again have this kind of oscillations. Eventually, it will go to one. And why it goes to one at uh, large distances, that uh, I'll leave it as an exercise. Given the fact that this geofar goes to one at uh, large distances, why that implies that for large k, s of k also go to one at large distances. Uh, there is a, for that, you have to define a yeah, dimensionless, and that you have to put in a one over row there for it to go to one at long distances. <clears throat> you can see here, there is volume here. Uh, <clears throat> so this, 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 this makes the whole thing dimensionless. The uh, integral here, and then this, these things, of course, also have uh, dimension. <clears throat> Let me write down uh, one result, which uh, you can derive. S of k rho integral v of r, h of r, H of R is the function that I had defined uh, somewhere here. H of R is this G of R minus 1, is the pair correlation function. And uh, this actually shows that this will eventually have to go to 0, uh, go to 1 uh, at long, uh, large values of k. Uh, this uh, peak will occur when this k is of the order of 2 pi divided by a 0. Of course, the peak that we have in the G of R is at uh, a 0. Uh, interparticle spacing. Uh, so just a uh, you know, simple thing about Fourier transform tells me that corresponding k vector is going to be like that. So k times a0 is something like 7 or something like that, where you have this first peak, and then eventually it goes to 1 at long distances. So this also can be looked upon as a measure of the short-range order that you have in a liquid. Finally, one more function. So uh, and this function is called the direct pair correlation function. How many have, have you seen this direct pair correlation function? Is that, uh, it's not something that you easily measure. But uh, oh, I should say that you know, what is the physical importance of this uh, uh, static structure factor is that uh, this is basically uh, you measure from uh, scattering experiments. That if you have a probe 
which couples to the local density. Then if you look at, uh, do an experiment, uh, which is associated with scattering of that probe from your liquid, light scattering or neutron scattering or something like that, then uh, the scattering cross-section can be related to this uh, structure factor. <clears throat> mm. Okay, so this is uh, all related to this uh, G of R and, uh, you know, its definition and uh, something to do about its, its properties and so on and so forth. Uh, as I said, there is one more function that I want to define, which is called the direct pair correlation function. So let me just uh, do that and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, one can calculate this, this thing. So this is uh, somewhat of a formal thing. The point is, you see, I mean, this is, a, but there is a general thing that I know uh, is, is it's worthwhile sp spend a little bit of time on. So we are looking at correlations. We are looking at the density uh, at two different points, R and R prime, and we want to look at if there is a fluctuation of density at one point, then uh, how will that affect the uh, density fluctuations at some other point? So <clears throat> then uh, uh, people often. Uh, I mean, you know, now I mean, all of you are somewhat advanced, but when one sort of uh, first introduces this concept, there is a confusion as to uh, <clears throat> when you have this in interactions which are short range. So basically, if I now look at uh, interaction which goes to zero, let's say at uh, two interparticle spacing. So if I look at two particles which are separated by more than two interparticle spacings, then uh, uh, they don't interact directly. The corresponding potential energy term is equal to zero. So the question is then how the density at these two different points, which are separated by uh, <coughs> some length, which is bigger than the range of the potential, how they eventually get correlated. Because this becomes much more uh, pronounced when you look at, let's say, phase transitions and things like that, where you have a correlation length that becomes arbitrarily large. Interactions are still short range, nearest neighbor interaction. Look at the Ising model. Ising model, you have nearest neighbor interactions, but it has a transition to ferromagnetic phase. Where the uh, range of correlations, if I look at the magnetization at one point, magnetization at some other point, or two spins separated by a distance which is many, many lattice spacings, then that correlation does not go to zero. So one has to sort of distinguish between uh, interaction and correlation. Uh, in the sense that, you know, interactions can be short range, doesn't necessarily mean that correlations also will have to be short range. And uh, in general, the effect of correlations spreads over distances which are generally larger than the uh, range of the interaction. So in principle, I mean, you know, this one physical way of looking at it is that if I look at say, many particles that you have in the system, here's your box, and now you have particles here. And let's say we have a range of interaction which is uh, sort of uh, like this, this much. So then you can say that these two particles are interacting with each other, each other, so the motion of this particle will be affected by the motion of that particle, and so they uh, certainly will have to be correlated. But then if I look at this particle and uh, some other particle like that, these are not directly interacting with each other. So then uh, you no know, one asks the question of uh, whether it is necessarily true that they will be also uncorrelated. But it's not true that they are going to be uncorrelated, they will be correlated. So the correlation then spreads through other particles. Let's say here, uh, these two are correlated, this will be correlated with that, this will be correlated with that, eventually this will be correlated with that, and so on and so forth. So the fact that, you know, uh, you have this direct correlation, this interacting with that, uh, this interacting with that, this direct correlations which arise from the direct interaction, that can propagate through intermediate particles, and that is what leads to correlations, which extend over uh, longer distances than the range of the interaction. So this uh, C of R, the direct pair correlation function that I'm about to define, that basically, uh, in some sense, uh, takes into account that, 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 that because of direct interaction, there would be some correlation, but there will be also other correlations coming through other particles uh, indirectly like this. So this G of R function, or this H of R, H of R function, which measures correlations, that can be broken up into an infinite series of terms, 
which will have this kind of thing that I'm talking about. That direct correlation and then correlation mediated by some other particle, correlation mediated by two other particles like that. Yeah, not that I know of. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I actually don't know very much about this uh, hyper uniform system. So. Why it becomes long range uh, in hyper uniform system? And, I mean, that one can get. I mean, if you look at, for example, how C of R is required to, re related to S of K, then I mean, if S of K is zero uh, behavior, we'll tell you about uh, the behavior of a. H of R. From that, you can get the behavior of C of R. But why? Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah. 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 It, uh, yeah, so I mean, we'll see how it is defined and then we'll see that uh, uh, that can be sort of interpreted or looked upon uh, as this kind of spread of correlations through in intermediate particles. But, you know, that's a uh, picture. There is this, uh, to define this, it's basically through what is known as the uh, einstein zernike relation. So I have already told you about these functions uh, G and H. H is the uh, pair correlation function. So <clears throat> what uh, I'm going to write, the, write this H in the following way. So this, you can say, is a definition. So I have defined this C. H is something that we had already defined somewhere here. Uh, I'm just writing out in, 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 in a, a form where I specify the two coordinates, R1 and R2. 1, 2 basically represents R1 and R2. But uh, H, I mean, also this the way that I have written down this equation, it applies to translational invariant system. So you have to eventually see that this depends only on R1 minus R2 mod, et cetera, et cetera. But it's uh, more convenient to write it this way when you're defining the uh, direct pair correlation function. So H then is written as uh, this direct pair correlation function. And then a second term that involves the convolution of this uh, direct pair correlation function with the function H itself. So uh, what is the physical content of this? And this is uh, what I was trying to sort of explain there that uh, you can sort of iterate this equation. Here there is a H32. H32 again, you can try to write in this particular form. So what will that be? So C12 is there. There is a row, and then C13. And H32, uh, again, you write in this particular form. The first term will be C32. And then you integrate over dr3. And then there will be another term, which will have this row squared, involving, again, this c and h. But that h also you express in terms of this c, etc., etc. So if you keep on iterating that, you will generate more and more terms involving this c's. And all intermediate so the c's will, so there are two endpoints here, r1 and r2. Uh, so this r1 and r2 are there, the intermediate point is integrated over. And so the next term will be, again, integral dr3. C13. C32, 34. 
That's an equation, yeah. So, and you know, this series continues forever. Because every time I do replace a C by this quantity, there is another H. So that H, again, you replace, uh, express in terms of C. So there will be three Cs, four Cs, like that. Yep. So C is now, is, uh, I'm now defining this. C is uh, uh, through this equation. Yep. So, no. So this is called Ornstein uh, Zernike relation. It's an integral real space, it's an integral relationship because C is also appearing in there, here in the integral. But uh, this becomes, uh, just it's worthwhile to point that out, it becomes uh, simpler in Fourier space. This Fourier space, uh, the convolution just basically becomes a product. And so, if I now look at uh, Fourier transforms of these quantities, so this will be H of K, C of K, plus rho, C of K, H of K. And so, if you know this H, uh, then you can get its Fourier transform, and then from that you can get this C, and then transform back to a real space, that will give you C of R. Now, and uh, so this will be rho squared. Now, the structure of this equation with uh, this sort of what I was trying to uh, say there, waving my hand, uh, is, should be obvious. That here, we are looking at the correlation between H is specifically a, uh, a pair correlation function. H equals zero basically means that no correlation is there. <coughs> so, uh, this now, this one part, which is directly associated with these two points, that I have uh, as arguments of this H. But then, this involves its intermediate point. And this intermediate point can be anywhere. And you are looking at multiplying it by the density, which is the probability of finding one particle at that intermediate point. Here, it is proceeding through intermediate points three and four, two intermediate points. And then again, you get a row squared, which is basically a measure of uh, the probability of finding two other particles at these points, R3 and R4. But they, have, uh, they can be anywhere. So basically, then you have to integrate over this R3 and R4 and so on and so forth. So this C function, which is, uh, uh, that's why it is called a direct pair correlation function, that in some sense, it uh, represents the direct effect of one particle on, on some other particle, but in a very sort of crude sense, in the hand-waving sense, as I'm just trying to do here. So here, this is one, and this is two, this could be three, four, five intermediate points, and the correlation is propagating through these intermediate points. Uh, and uh, you have to, of course, that can happen only when there's a particle here, particle here, particle there, that you get this factors of rho. And then uh, these points can be anywhere. Uh, so you have integral over uh, R3, R4, all the intermediate points. Hmm. Hmm? CK plus rho into CK times HK. Hmm? No, I mean, that is the uh, 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 nice thing about Fourier transforms. Uh, integration over real space becomes a uh, product in Fourier space, if there is you know, translational invariance and all those things like that. <coughs> so, this is basically... Uh, uh, Oh, I should say a little bit about uh, how this uh, uh, C function looks like. Because, uh, when, again, from this kind of uh, vague arguments, one expects that uh, the range of this C function in general should not be much longer than the range of the interparticle potential. But there are special cases, as Srikanth was pointing out, these hyper uniform systems. Hmm. Yes. Two and five, so one and two. Uh, it depends on it depends on the distances. So I mean, you have some distance here, you have some distance there, 
No, no, I mean, just uh, I've, I've given you that form of this typical form of this uh, G of R or H of R, right? And that range is uh, bigger than the range of the potential, right? And there's a distance dependence. So if I want to look at the correlation between any two points, one and two, all I have to do is look at the distance between this, go to that picture, and point, point out, uh, find out uh, at that point, at, this, at that distance, what is the correlation. And in general, since this correlation falls up with distance, whenever I have a distance which is bigger than some other distance, the correlation in the first case will be less. No, 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 this picture you shouldn't take uh, all, that, all that seriously. Because, uh, as I was saying, uh, here the intermediate points are integrated over. So if this is R1 and R2, doesn't mean that 3 has to be near R1. R3 is integral is over all space. So R3 can be here. Right? If I look at the equation that I have written down for the C, it's, it's possible that the corresponding you know, 1, 3, and 3, 2, these distances are very large, corresponding Cs will go to 0. But 1 is not restricting this, uh, this C has to be very close to either 1 or 2, apart from you know, the, uh, specifying the form of this C. And if you're looking at correlations, since typically 1 is looking at uh, 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 short-range order system, Correlations will decay as a function of distance. So if you look at two points which are separated by distance which is much bigger compared to the distance between two other points, in the first case, the correlation will be weaker. But you have oscillations also. So in this case, that doesn't always work. Because as you can see here, if I look at this correlation, here, the correlation is this much, but uh, if I go some distance here, uh, the correlation is this much. So the distance is smaller, but the correlation is less. So, I mean, you know, uh, uh, if it is not monotonic, if there are oscillations, then you cannot make this statement that larger distances will always give you lesser correlations. Another 25 minutes. So, so this is all I, have, uh, I wanted to talk about as far as these correlations are concerned. These are uh, definitions of various functions and uh, some uh, uh, statements about how they behave. And uh, this C function, actually, I don't have much of a physical. So, I mean, I'll draw a C function for a typical uh, simple model systems, but why is it like that? Age is what you can calculate from simulations. When you do theory, then actually one calculates C. Yeah. So let's just write this C of R versus for a Leonard Jones type system. That's what I'm doing. This is R over sigma. Uh, and then it has something that looks like this. This is zero. And this is one. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, uh, it goes to zero at large distances, but it doesn't go to zero uh, at, 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 at sigma. There is a tail. And uh, the typical values here, of course, will depend on uh, you know, what density, etc., that you're looking at. So I'm not going to put that down. But it is a short range function, and it has uh, typically this kind of a kink like uh, structure. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, different approximations. This is something that, again, as uh, we have been discussing, we cannot measure directly uh, from experiments or from simulations, whereas these correlation functions are easily measurable from uh, both experiments and simulations. Not easily, but measurable. Uh, <clears throat> and then from that, you have to go back and use this on strange learning relationship between C and H to get what this C is, and then you get C in real space. <clears throat> So, uh, given this, then I mean, you know, uh, the, the point is, this, I mean, you know, this is all a lot of work to define all these things and uh, uh, sort of define relationships among these and so on and so forth. But why? And what is the purpose? 
Uh, again, you know, uh, it depends on the model, depends on which calculation you're doing, and so on. Uh, no, I mean, there's only one, I mean, in the C, I think, at the length scale that you're seeing is the uh, sigma, the interaction length scale. Ah, decay is there, but uh, that decay, I don't know. There is a specific length scale that you can see in H. Hey, maybe Srikant will know. Yeah, this is what I was saying that, you know, I don't have much of a uh, uh, physical insight into this. So the way this is decaying, that defends uh, some length scale is there. So how, what, what is that length scale that shows up in uh, uh, H or G? But then, you know, Parker's if you go to uh, some other uh, uh, sort of more sophisticated approximation, then you get something which sort of extends beyond sigma. Yeah. So, so, yeah, that's a good question that we have to be worth thinking about. <laughs> yes. Uh, then again, you know, if you have a liquid, then uh, although, I mean, this is the other way around, where the interactions uh, can extend over uh, long distances, but in a liquid, the correlations will still be short range. In range of the interaction. If you have a, a Coulomb system, plasma, or something like that, uh, then again, you know, you have uh, this geofar doesn't look very different from what I have just drawn here. Ah. So uh, actually, there is a the simplest approximation for this C of R is this is, this is uh, minus beta one over kVT times the actual interparticle uh, potential minus beta v. So uh, in that approximation, of course, this will show a long tail if we have power law interactions. Hmm. <laughs> So what is the meaning of uh, negative C? So, I mean, you know, you have to uh, basically go back and look at uh, this equation, right? So what is this H of K? H of K, one, one minus rho C of K is equal to C of K. This H of K is, uh, <coughs> then, you know, C divided by H of K. So from here, one can see that, you know, if uh, this can be, since the C can be both positive and negative, it's uh, C of K can also be both positive and negative. But uh, this uh, just tells you that there is, again, some kind of an instability if rho C of K becomes close to 1. So that's all I can say about, you know, uh, some physical requirement for this uh, C of K. Uh, if C of K is negative, then uh, what does it uh, imply as far as the actual correlations in the uh, system is concerned. That <coughs> only way that I can look at it is through this kind of relationship, not directly by looking at C and saying that it is like negative here, so that corresponds to this feature in, in G of R and so on. So in that sense, uh, at least my, my, uh, my impression is that this uh, yeah. C is uh, something which is, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, dependence on R. Uh, it's difficult to find a direct physical uh, meaning of that dependence. Is there anybody else who has something else to add to this? That would be welcome. In, in H. And uh, the relationship between G and S, for example, or H or S, that I can sort of visualize. But the, the relationship between C and G or C and S is something that uh, I cannot point out one feature here that is related to one feature there. Yeah, <laughs> good question. 
So, I mean, uh, uh, the importance of C is actually basically in, in, in theoretical calculations. For example, if you want to have a theory which calculates this H of R, given the microscopic interactions. There, those theories, as uh, if I have time, I don't know whether I much, much time we'll have, but there, the one proceeds through C and defines, you know, uh, the relationship. This is, so this is one thing that uh, connects this H with C. But these are both unknowns. So this you will not be able to determine uh, either one of them just from one of the situations. So in liquid state theory, there are other closer approx approximations, which gives you another relationship between C and uh, H. So using both of them, then you can determine both. And this uh, closure approximations, again, one can rationalize it as some terms that you generate in perturbation expansion and things like that. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, you know, that, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that uh, goes back to this picture, that if I look at just the uh, correlation between uh, two particles coming from their own interaction, not by through other, other, yeah. So whatever range is there, that will say that that's, uh, up to that point, direct correlations will propagate in space. <clears throat> oh, so what uh, he was saying is that C has this uh, uh, tail, let's say. So there is some distance. So that, let's say it is, it's basically to the minus r divided by some, uh, some epsilon or something like that. So there is some length parameter. So what is the length? So C is, according to our uh, this hand waving uh, um, uh, sort of picture, is the correlation between two particles coming directly from their interactions. So this length can be the range of that correlation. That if you uh, don't look at correlations which are being in propagated by some other intermediate particles, just directly how particle one and particle two are affecting each other, those correlations uh, again will. One and two are very far apart. They will not affect each other, so there will be a range associated with that. And one can think of this length parameter, or where it goes to zero, if it is not exponential, it will go to zero at some point, so there is some length here. So if we say C being the direct influence of one particle on another, the question is how far these two particles have to be from each other for that influence to be present. C and, uh, yeah, I mean, C and, uh, if you know calculate C, then you can calculate H. Hmm. Other way around, yeah. So there are, there will be, you need two uh, relationships. This is just definition. This is the onstein zernike relation, which is just a definition of this C. So there has to be some other information that has to go into it. And uh, this other information comes from there are these various liquid state theories, integral equation theories, uh, which then uh, use another relationship between C and H, uh, which then one can use to calculate both of these functions. So since time is short, I'll not really, uh, you know, I don't have, uh, we'll be able to go into uh, more details in some of the things. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to point out is that this uh, G function or the H function, uh, these functions play a very important role in liquid state theories because many quantities of interest can be calculated if you know these functions. So earlier we were talking about, uh, yesterday we were talking about the equation of state, the pressure. So, and the uh, you know, Waals equation is basically something that uh, tells you about uh, how the pressure can be related to the volume and temperature. So the question is of whether one can do it for the liquid also. What is the uh, liquid also? Of course, uh, again, it's a uh, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium system that we're looking at. So given, let's say, density and uh, temperature, uh, it will have a pressure. So the uh, question is how one can calculate it. So <clears throat> one can show that if you know these functions, this G function, then from that one can calculate what the pressure is through some virial theorem and so on. Again, you know, I can work it out, but it will take 10-15 uh, minutes. I will write down a few expressions that will tell you about what kind of things you can calculate 
from a knowledge of uh, this G of R. So, for example, uh, uh, we are talking about this uh, potential energy. So, uh, of course, I mean, there will be an internal energy of the liquid, which will have a kinetic energy part and the potential energy part. The kinetic energy part is trivial in, a, in, a, in, a, in this three of 10 kBT, it's basically the equipartition value. You're looking at classical particles. So that is just the uh, usual thing that you have for an ideal gas. But the potential energy part is the difficult one. So how to calculate this potential energy part, which is basically U average. So I'll just write down a formula for this U average, which I think you should be able to uh, rationalize very easily. This is the number density, integral r squared v of r. And this integral is over the uh, volume that uh, encloses the system. So this should be obvious, right? V is the interparticles for uh, two-body potential. So one is looking at the potential when the two particles are separated by some distance r. G of r is basically the probability associated with two particles being at that distance. And then you integrate over all space. Uh, these are just basically additional factors that you get when you do the integrals and so on. So if you know it's uh, G of r, then from that, uh, of course, I mean, the V of r is given to you in the sense that the model specifies what the potential is. Uh, so this will give you the internal energy. From that, you can calculate specific heat and stuff like that. <clears throat> There is one more uh, equation, which is a pressure equation, which uh, I will not derive. <coughs> I'll just write it down. Beta times P divided by rho, 1 minus 2 pi divided by 3 beta rho integral. So this is integral sub zero to infinity for the thermodynamic limit. R cubed, yeah. So V prime is basically the derivative of this V with respect to R. So if V is the interparticle's potential, its derivative with respect to R gives you both the force. So it is not surprising that uh, the this force basically comes in in the equation that describes uh, uh, or gives you the pressure in terms of this uh, two-point function G of R. Hmm? Derivative. Yeah, this is actually R cubed, the second equation. Derivative is second. Yeah. So I mean, you know, it's useful to know what this what this uh, functions are because many thermodynamic properties, equilibrium properties of a liquid, then can be understood in terms of the behavior of these functions as you change, for example, the temperature, the density, and things like that. Uh, I didn't say much about this, but uh, what happens is this: that uh, you look at this two-point function. Uh, <coughs> As you make the liquid more dense, or as you go to lower temperatures, keeping the density constant, these oscillations become more pronounced. And so, as we are talking about, there is some kind of a length scale associated with this, the decay of this, uh, this peaks. That length scale will increase as you go to lower temperatures, for example, or go to a more dense system. But this increase is not uh, spectacular. This increases maybe by, uh, you know, 50 percent eventually. Or something that changes from maybe uh, one to three or some such thing like that. Never becomes long ranged. So uh, the, and there is short range order, which becomes more pronounced as one is in a more interacting situation, either low temperatures or higher density. <clears throat> OK, so then uh, the question is how one can calculate this. Again, uh, not much time. So today we are not doing this, not the additional 15 minutes. <laughs> no. Uh, so yeah, I'll just, uh, uh, hmm. yeah, we can discuss this more in the tutorial. Uh, so there are different classes of theories. I mean, this is, as I said, uh, the theory of liquids is uh, kind of a mess in the sense that <laughs> uh, uh, there are many approximations that people use, but uh, this approximation sometimes are difficult to justify. Uh, well, I mean, you know, there's nothing uh, special about the theory of liquids. I mean, any sort of uh, many-body system where the effects of interactions are very pronounced 
there are no sort of very well-defined, uh, reliable way of doing theoretical calculations of such thermodynamic properties. So it's not an exception. Uh, <coughs> So I'll just tell you about two classes of theories. Uh, the first class is, uh, since I'm talking about this C, uh, <coughs> first class is basically disclosure approximations. So this equation, as I said, uh, go to Fourier space, we'll write out h of k is c of k plus number density c of k times h of k. This is the Ornstein Zernike. Uh, <clears throat> so as I said, there are a class of liquid state theories where this equation is complemented by another equation involving this h and c, and uh, those equations are no longer exact. So the closure equation that uh, there are various approximations for this closure approximation, uh, closure equation, uh, go under the name of, uh, you know, there is a hypernated chain approximation, then there is Parker's Eric approximation, there is Rogers Young approximation, all sorts of liquid state theory approximations, which supposedly work good for, one approximation works good for one kind of systems, some other approximation works good for some other kind of system, and there is no very systematic way of uh, a priori saying that if I'm looking at a system where the interaction is given to you, what is the best uh, liquid state theory that one can do, which will give me this uh, functions h and c. So, <clears throat> and uh, these various approximations that I'm going to write down, I write down a couple of approximations, so closure equations. Uh, there is also one way of deriving those uh, approximations through perturbation theory. Just like, you know, in the case uh, I was talking about yesterday, where uh, you will have a perturbation expansion uh, for, let's say, the pressure or uh, grand canonical partition function or grand canonical potential. Uh, here also, one can develop uh, perturbative expansion for these two-point functions. Uh, maybe I'll uh, show you a little bit about how that is to be done in the, in the, in the, in the tutorial. Uh, <coughs> so there will be this perturbation expansion, but when you're in the liquid state, this perturbation expansion is not expected to very, be very nicely behaved in the sense that you keep first three terms in the perturbation expansion, that gives you a very good approximation for the actual behavior of the system. It's not expansion. So the, the people do some things, which is again quite familiar with various many-body theory uh, treatments. Uh, instead of uh, stopping at, let's say, first order, second order, third order in perturbation theory, what people do is, is one take a particular class of diagrams and sum those diagrams to infinite order. Okay, but this is not being consistent because some diagrams, which are let's say fourth or fifth order in, in, the, in, the, in the expansion parameter are being kept, whereas some other diagrams which are the same order in the expansion parameter are not being kept. So the question is which class of diagrams you are going to sum to infinite order. And that is determined by convenience. Because uh, when you eventually want some kind of a geometric series or whatever that you can sum to up to infinite order. And so that's, that, that's the way it is done. And, and, and if, you, if you look at electrons in a metal or something like that, there is something called random phase approximation, which is basically bubble diagrams you sum to infinite order. And many other uh, such approximations exist in many-body theory. And in uh, liquid state theory, there are these various approximations which correspond to summing a particular class of diagrams up to arbitrarily large order, whereas uh, leaving out many other diagrams that uh, are there in the actual expansion. So. <clears throat> I'll just write down two closure approximations. <sighs> so this is, uh, of course, there in Einstein Zanike. I'll write down something which is called a hypernated chain approximation. And don't ask me why it is called hypernated chain. And I have no, absolutely no idea uh, where, it is, where it is called that. But again, it comes from diagrammatics. I mean, one is basically keeping some diagrams which, uh, you know, the person who looked at it uh, the, uh, first thought that may have something to do with. But again, I mean, uh, what, it, what it means, I, I have no idea. Uh, 
And to make things worse, I've defined a new quantity y of r. This is the definition. <laughs> so basic, the basic quantities are this h and c. Uh, c is the direct pair correlation function, h is the pair, uh, the usual pair correlation function. And uh, the potential, of course, is something that is specified for the model that we are looking at. So this is the hypernated chain closure in real space. You write this C of R as, and there is another closure, which is called parker Cevic. It is a C of R. It's basically the same as this, except that instead of putting this y in the exponent, I just uh, one just looks at the first term in the exponential uh, expansion of that. So uh, at this point, I don't have actually very much to say about uh, the physical content of these equations. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, this tells you about how these are quantities are going to be calculated, in the sense that uh, now we have a, a real space equation for this C relationship between C and y. So, for example, you start with some kind of uh, a guess for this uh, C of R, and then from that you can calculate what this Y is going to be. From Y you get what is H, then you go here, recalculate C, and then go through this loop uh, many, many times until one has convergence. So then uh, you have uh, both C of R or C of K and H of R, uh, both these functions are there. And uh, a priori, it is very difficult to say whether, uh, you know, given a particular system, uh, which of these approximations will work better. Uh, there are some uh, sort of uh, anecdotal evidence saying that if you have a very short, short range, hard sphere type uh, interaction, then uh, the Parker-Sievic approximation works better. Whereas if you have soft interactions which have longer range, then this HNC, hypernetic chain approximation, is supposed to give you better results. But uh, as far as I know, there is no sort of uh, a way of seeing that at the beginning, that uh, why it works better in this case and why it works better in some other case. Uh, these are all, uh, when you do this calculation, get the functions, compare it with uh, simulations mostly, and then find out which one works better. <clears throat> so I guess my time is out. Hmm. Uh, I think so. I mean, you know, uh, some of these uh, approximations or some of the schemes actually have, have been carried out even when you have, there's a log interaction, I know, log interaction is one case that we have done, we have two-dimensional uh, plasma log interaction, so there one can get these functions. Hmm? Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, sir. So I guess, you know, uh, this uh, will be, this sort of things that I've been sort of told you about uh, will be uh, used in uh, the talks that we'll hear next week, where there will be extensive discussions of dense liquids and glasses and so on and so forth. So these are sort of very elements of uh, elementary things that one should know about liquid state theory, that, uh, uh, to understand what, what those people are going to talk about, I think this will be useful. I hope.